Good morning, everybody. We had a nice little intro as we entered this morning with some Van Morrison and Crosby, Stills and Nash. So I want to thank you for that little warm-up music we enjoyed. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you this morning to our Hospital Grand Rounds and my distinct privilege and honor to introduce to you um, our speaker for this morning. Dr. Hines, Dr. Pamela Hines is the Director of our Department of Nursing Research and Quality Outcomes and the Co-Director of the Center for Translational Science here at Children's National. She is a Professor of Pediatrics at George Washington University. She's an Adjunct Professor for the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing, and the University of Maryland College of Nursing. Pam received her undergraduate degree from the University of Vermont and her master's and doctoral degrees from the University of Arizona in psychiatric nursing and clinical research, respectively. For more than three decades now, Pam has created and led research related to the pediatric cancer experience, quality of life, fatigue and altered sleep during the treatment of pediatric cancers, and end-of-life communication and decision-making. To this end, she has served on the Institute of Medicine 2003 Committee on End of Life and Palliative Care for Children in America, the National Quality Forum Panel on Palliative and End of Life Care in America, the IOM 2014 Committee on Dying, and the IOM Working Group on Cancer Care. Dr. Hines is an Oncology Nursing Society nurse researcher and the Association of Pediatric Oncology and Hematology Distinguished Nurse Researcher. She was the inaugural chair of the Nurse Scholars for the Children's Oncology Group and the inaugural co-director for the Patient Reported Outcomes Resource Center for the Children's Oncology Group. She served on the National Cancer Institute Symptom and Quality of Life Scientific Committee and the National Institute of Nursing Research Ad Hoc Evaluation Advisory Committee, End of Life and Palliative Care Sciences and she is the Editor-in-Chief for the journal Cancer Nursing, and International Cancer Journal. She has published in more than 215 peer-reviewed journals with many, many articles. And I should, I should amend that, 215 peer-reviewed articles in many, many journals. In May 2014, Pam was named as our inaugural inductee to the William and Joanne Conway Endowed Chair for Nursing Research <coughs> here at Children's. Her extensive research demonstrates the roles that communication, hopefulness, and palliative care play in increasing healthy, healthy outcomes for patients and families, even in situations where death in, is inevitable. Pam shared with me um, at, at the, uh, just a few minutes ago that despite her numerous contributions and numerous activities um, in the world of healthcare, um, she still has those few moments of nerves before she speaks. Um, so I want to say that in addition to the many, many contributions that Pam has made here um, regionally, nationally, and internationally, so many of us um, have been influenced by Pam's integrity, her love of science, and her joy of discovery. It is my honor and my privilege to welcome Dr. Hines this morning. Good morning, all. I am hugely excited to be with every one of you. Thank you for caring about this topic. And Linda, thank you so much for the warm words of welcome. Isn't it harder to present to the home audience because you care about everybody in the audience and you have to face them again? <laughs> but I do bring you very friendly greetings from the Division of Nursing, the Center for Translational Science, the Department of Nursing Research and Quality Outcomes, and also the Pediatric Palliative and End-of-Life Research and Care Special Interest Group that we have here at Children's National. And I know you recognize many of these faces. These are individuals who come across disciplines, specialties here at Children's National, but also join us from Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, University of Pennsylvania, University of Tennessee, Wayne State, DeVos Hospital, and several other places. We meet monthly and really do well looking at how care and research related to palliative and end of life can merge our joint efforts. You are warmly welcome to join us. 
I also want to welcome you to the month of November, which is the national month for the entire nation, looking at palliative and end-of-life care. This month, we've had a host of events, and you might have seen Dr. Ann Watson host Gift of Grace. She has one more to host. You might have seen Dr. Debbie LaFon initiate a brand new curriculum called Panda Cubs. You might have heard Dr. Bill Novelli yesterday speak to us about two textbooks related to palliative and end of life. Next week will be the highlight of the month. Dr. Tessie October will be talking about communication, our own research that we are doing here and the research that is happening elsewhere. Uh, it's a not to be missed occasion. But during our moments together, I'd like very much for us to converse about how is it that the Institute of Medicine has begun to play such a primary figure in end of life for our nation? And how is it that we, as pediatric specialists, can actually counter myths that are free-floating about children dying in America? What words can you and I choose to counter some of these myths? Words that we will need at the point of care and words that we will need in boardrooms where policies are being set. So as part of our conversation today, I'll be sharing with you brief snippets of research that we are doing here, and then I'll be asking you, what are your words? What words will you use? What would you like us at Children's National to be known for at end of life with children? But let's begin with what is end of life? How might we define this term? Might seem odd to ask that of ourselves, but in fact, we know we struggle with prognosis in pediatrics as we do in the adult world too. So may I offer you key phrases that are meant to describe, if not define, the word end of life. It is an ambiguous, but very important period of life certainly for the person who is dying, but I might argue for all those that are touched by that death as well. And it is the time when the illness progresses to such a point that the meaning in life is very low, so low, that we might even say that meaning has left, and this period ends then in a death. But most importantly, I would say to you, end of life is an amazing combination of biology and human values. And that is what makes it so complex to give end-of-life care, the complexity that you face routinely. The children do die, and there is something very important to know that they die quite differently from adults. What we know is that they are significantly more likely to die of rare diseases, not breast, not heart, not kidney, but rare diseases, which requires the specialization of all of you. We know that the children who die each year, and it's anywhere from 48,000 to about 52,000 who are 14 years of age and younger, the great majority will die in that first year of life. They will be born with us, and they will die with us, and they may never go home. What we do know is that in some age categories, we do have differences in how children die. So it's trauma and accident for children between ages one and four that are primary causes. But in three other age categories older, it's cancer. So it's a disease-related cause that is the primary cause of children dying. So though children may die differently from adults, there are very important points that are the same between adults and children who die in America, and that is the great majority of them die with us. More than 67% of children will die in a hospital setting. Now, that has begun to decrease ever so slightly in the last seven years, but by far, the great majority are still with us. And 74% of infants who die each year will die with us. And that means that a mere 33% are actually dying at home. So if the great majority are dying in inpatient settings, you and I have every access, every opportunity to make their dying better. 
And that brings us to the Institute of Health. There are some groups in this country who don't believe that government-funded agencies could ever be of much value, but I'd like to say to you that the Institute of Health, recently renamed, has actually proven itself to be a key player with end of life in this country. So I'd like to share with you just a few descriptions about what is the Institute of Medicine, and then I'd like to link that to three reports that are by far the most read of the reports that have been issued by the Institute of Medicine. Interestingly enough, the Academy of uh, the American Academy of Science was created by Abraham Lincoln during his presidency. He was very perturbed about the number of people who came to him asking for government dollars, and they wanted him to fund different health initiatives, and he had no idea what was true and what was falsehood. And he wanted to trust science, and so he created the Academy to help inform him about the kind of decisions he ought to be making with American tax dollars. And that same role has continued for the Academy over the years. But in 1970, we created the Institute of Medicine to be much more specific about human health and what we could be doing in this country. So the purpose then of IOM is to advise us about how we can approach health in this country. It's interesting to me to look at who funds the Institute of Medicine reports. We're going to spend a little bit of time of, uh, discussing that further in just a few moments. Primarily, it's government agencies that really want to know how to spend their own budgets. But it also can be individual organizations, and it can even be well-funded individuals. So in brief, when you are appointed to an Institute of Medicine committee, there's a great deal of work that's gone on before you were ever appointed. I've had the privilege of serving on two Institute of Medicine committees at this point in time. So there are nominations, and you don't know that you've been nominated. Those nominations are vetted within the Institute of Medicine. You are then contacted and asked if you would serve if you were actually appointed. And then there's a very public vetting of all who have been nominated. And if there are concerns raised about any of the nominations, they may be removed from actually serving on the committee. There has to be a charge that you are given. The charge has to be approved by the leading bodies of government within the Institute of Medicine and the Academy. And then the charge comes to you as a standing committee for this one charge, this one report. And you get to suggest edits, but they may not be approved. You then have six to eight meetings over a two-year span, and you travel the country. You're collecting evidence, and some of the evidence is public testimony. And in both of the instances where I've had the privilege of serving, parents have come to talk about what it has been like to watch their children die, what it has been like to survive the loss of a child and not have health care readily available. <coughs> so there's public data gathering. We also did home visits to the home of dying patients. And then we collected and evaluated the integrity of all available data to us. We then wrote the report. My last committee actually had a scientific editor assigned. It was quite outstanding. And then that report is then submitted to the leadership of the Institute of Medicine and of the Academy. And then it goes out to at least a half dozen to a dozen external reviewers. The report comes back, you're asked to make revisions, and then the report is published. Many times, that is where the report sits. But I will share with you that the reports related to end of life had been so well funded, so well supported, that they were given an extra year of dissemination funding. That speaks to how important the funders felt the work was. May I take you to the very first report, which was issued by the Institute of Medicine on end of life, and that was in 1997. This was a report that was only addressing adults who die in America. Now, you'll notice that there are organizations within this report, policies, funding, clinical care, legal guidance, research, and recommendations. And out of this came seven recommendations. I'm only going to briefly highlight those, but may I ask you to remember this title, because in a few moments we're going to compare this title with two others. So the recommendations in 1997, and as I share with these with you, 
think back, it's 18 years since the report. And in front of you, as you look at the recommendations, you will see end-of-life care in America maturing. So in 1997, speaking of adult end-of-life, the recommendations were that palliative care should become a specialty. And as you know, we have now achieved that, but we did not have that 18 years ago. Research priorities from any group, but particularly NIH, should be implemented. No one on the NIH campus at that time had stepped forward to champion end-of-life funding. And public discourse on dying should be created. May I underscore this one for you? We're going to come back to this recommendation again because it continues to elude us. All health professionals should commit to improving care for the dying and effectively preventing suffering. And financing has got to be better for end-of-life care, and all curricula in this nation should formally address end-of-life. So as you know, these reports are very much occurring within a social, political context and I'm going to take you back just a few years before the report was issued and ask us what was happening in politics, healthcare, culture related to end of life in this nation. And I'm going to suggest to you this was what was happening. Do you remember the support study? By far the biggest end of life study at that time and to this time that we have ever done in this nation related to end of life. $29 million from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to try to improve end-of-life care for adults. They chose to work with adults in several different hospitals who they knew were at high risk of dying in the next six months. And they created an intervention and they randomized 4,000 adult patients. And for those patients who were in the intervention group, the physicians received prognostic information information about the likelihood of outcome for resuscitation for that particular patient, had a nurse available to help them clarify what the end-of-life preferences were for this patient and this family. And at the end of the support study, there were multiple outcomes that were measured. Satisfaction with care, cost of care, time spent in the intensive care unit before dying, preferences for end-of-life documented pain levels, and nothing was better in the intervention group than in the control group. Not one indicator was better. And physicians honestly spoke about not liking having a nurse come to them to explain their patient preferences. They did not like that. They found that offensive, and they only wanted to have that conversation with the patient, him or herself. The study was a huge failure. May I take you to the blue box, and may I point out to you then the funders of that 1997 Institute of Medicine End of Life Report. Notice Robert Wood Johnson figures prominently in funding that report, and they continue to be prominent funders of specialty groups, not large studies, but specialty initiatives related to End of Life. And that takes us to 2003, so now we jump forward a mere six years, and for the first time, the landmark report for end of life is strictly about children, children dying in America. Notice that structure that of the major topics that were addressed. It looks like a duplicate of the 1997 report, which was focused on adults, and indeed it is. I'm going to come back to that as well. This is the report that Dr. Joe uh, Wright and I had the privilege of serving on. I know many of you have had um, the pleasure of working with Joe now at Howard, and I want you to know he was a strong voice for us um, on this committee. Multiple recommendations came out of this particular report. I am not going to go into all of them, but again, see if you capture the maturing of end-of-life care and research in this nation as we now go forward six years. The focus here was on creating clinical care guidelines with a recognition that we did not have published clinical care guidelines to take care of dying and suffering children. 
If funding remained a serious problem for children who were dying, and that funders had so many rules and definitions, that care was often interrupted and not paid for. That there should be a regional effort, not institutional only, but regional, where parents could go and get information about resources because they were not able to find them in other locations. That all of us, as a pediatric setting, should have policy and procedures that we are all familiar with about how to include children in talking about end of life. And I'm really proud to say that Children's National has such a policy. That we should begin to collect descriptive data. Imagine, we did not in 2003 have data for us to develop empirically driven recommendations for care. We did not have descriptive data. Never mind the intervention work that was done with support in the adult world, we didn't have descriptive data. And that we should identify research priorities and we should implement them and someone should fund them. <laughs> so what was it then that went on before that committee happened? What was that social, cultural context within which this committee got appointed? I'm going to say to you, I think the biggest thing that happened was the 1997 report. That set the stage for now addressing it formally and because it was all about adults, we needed very much to focus on children. But at the same time, we were just beginning to get small, single-site descriptive reports on the number of symptoms that children had when they were dying, up to eight very troubling symptoms being reported by parents who continued to reflect on their children's suffering up to 24 months later. No doubt much longer, but the research ended at 24 months. What we also learned is that 50 to 80 percent of our children were dying in hospitals, particularly those children with complex chronic conditions, who in fact spent more of their last 90 days of life in the hospital than out of the hospital. And of those children who died in the hospital, up to 90 percent spent a week with us in the intensive care unit, receiving interventions that were labeled as not likely to produce positive effects. And what I would like to really credit is the American Academy of Pediatrics, which stepped forward with a definition of palliative care saying, it is from the moment of a diagnosis of a potentially life-threatening illness or condition. It is to happen early, and the focus is to be on reducing suffering. Notice the funders of this particular report, the National Institute of Nursing Research, now you'll hear about them being the point institute on the NIH campus for funding end-of-life research. But once again, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And now may I take you forward to the 2015, and I'm going to suggest to you that politics gets even more interesting. This particular Institute of Medicine report was co-chaired by Phil Pizzo. Many of you know him and his incredible contributions to pediatrics. Phil and I represented pediatrics on this particular committee. Notice, structured very differently. And when you see the recommendations, you will once again see the maturing of end-of-life care and research in our nation in a mere 18 years. So five recommendations came out of this report that persons near, uh, sorry, findings. These findings are data-driven, and that's the huge difference for the previous two reports. And that includes data on pediatrics. So we are at a very different point in time in being able to make recommendations. So these are the findings, some of which are very positive. Persons nearing end of life continue in America to have multiple and burdensome transitions in care. There is no one person who stays with them across transitions. What is encouraging is that hospice is now much more likely to be involved in the care of a dying person and the family, from 17% to 45% in recent years. I find this to be very encouraging. However, of all of those participating in hospice care, it's a mere fraction of about 500 children a year participate in hospice. So we have much we can travel along the road of improvement. 
I do want you to know that a huge improvement in 18 years is that 85% of all large hospitals, 300 beds or more, now report having palliative care services. We are very fortunate here to have a thriving panda team. That is, there are people in this room who lead that work. I would particularly like to call out Dr. Debbie LaFlan. I'm not sure if Dr. Sean Jacobs is here, but there are other good, good colleagues who are vital for that program. Dr. Ted in October, right there. We are incredibly fortunate to have this service here. I also would point out to you that we do now have palliative care clinical guidelines for pediatrics. But they are not well cited in the literature. They are not well adopted across the nation. We have to ask ourselves, why? Why the slowness? We also have three additional major findings for us to consider that most persons, adult, child, nearing end of life, will not be physically, emotionally, or cognitively able to tell others what their preferences are for end of life care. Waiting for end of life is very dangerous. This calls into play as the stellar research being led here at Children's National by Dr. Maureen Lyon and her team. What we do know from our studies with children and also with adults is that when we talk about end of life, that person doing the talking is far less likely then to receive care that he or she does not want. And in my own research, we've been able to document children are very competent, very able to declare what are their preferences for end of life care. And here we come back to that same topic again, communication. That communication between clinician, patient, and family continues to be reported by patients and families as the most disappointing aspect of end-of-life care. I also am excited to share with you that we do now have the medical specialty board certification for physicians. And in that 18-year period, over 6,000 of our physicians are now board certified. More than 14,000 nurses are certified in pediatric hospice and palliative care. Certification board has now caught on, and we have a strong core of experts. But we believe it's one third of what we need, and the expectation now is that all of us in all of our education who are not going to be the palliative and end of life care experts will be competent to reduce suffering and will know how to consult well with our experts. We do have small examples across the country where we have combined medical and social priorities for families into very well-regarded models of care for end of life, but they're small. We haven't spread them. We need to look at why do we not have institutional models or regional models. So based on those findings, we have five recommendations from the 2015 Institute of Medicine report. First, all insurers must provide comprehensive care for end of life. And I want to call out to you that it was government and private funders who were named in the report, and in particular, CMS. And when I participated in the NIH debriefing, CMS was particularly well represented and openly saying, Tell us, what do we find? The second is that all of us in professional associations should have standards related to clinician, patient, family, communication. We should know what it is that we want to accomplish. We should be so familiar that we can teach it at the point of care. That all of us should be very involved in education and credentialing at all levels of education to take care of people at end of life. And that payers must pay for these small models that I just described to you that combine medical and social priorities. We cannot fund one half without the other. And that all of us must begin to talk about end of life and have data to include in those conversations. All right, so now let's look back together over these three reports. 18 years, three very different reports. Notice they say that the healthcare professional and other agencies is accountable. Is accountable to be well educated. Is accountable to educate the public. Is accountable to ensure that funding is smooth and consistent and available. 
that we provide the best of care, that we communicate. But across all three reports, the conclusion has been communication continues to be elusive. Why is it in America we're struggling to have this conversation related to end of life? If you talk with Ellen Goodman, one of the reporters for the Boston Globe who has looked into many of their end of life investigations in the area, our healthcare system may not need more intervention, but more conversation, especially on the delicate subject of dying. And the ethicist George Anna has been quoted as saying, America cannot accept death as anything but defeat. How then? If we are dealing with avoidance of conversation, perception of defeat, do we begin to have conversation? What we have said in the prologue of our IOM report is that dying in America is deeply personal human experience. We perceive it very differently if it's a child dying, a person mid-career, mid-life, or an older person. But nonetheless, dying is always subjective, and it is deeply personal. Why then would you and I care about end-of-life communication? I'm going to suggest to you that this is the frontier in pediatrics. It is the chance for us to prevent complications. You and I are tremendously prepared, prepared for prevention in pediatrics. We're known for that. What is it then that you and I need to prevent when a child is dying? Of course, we would say suffering of the child, but I would like you to go beyond that and consider that you are preventing health complications for a lifetime for the family. We know now from national studies that fathers who experience the loss of a child to any cause are statistically significantly more likely to have to leave the work world early on medical disability. We know that mom who lose a child are statistically significantly more likely to have a first psychiatric hospitalization. So if we lose, then, the emotional integrity of a family, who then can look out for the surviving children in the family, you and I have a chance to do something to prevent the risk of those complications for families who will lose a child to death. We say death is deeply personal very hard to talk about. We rarely talk about it ourselves. I don't know how many of us in this room have completed advanced care documents. That's one way of talking about our own loss. Imagine then how much harder it is to talk about the loss of your child. From our own research, we've learned that parents can barely tolerate speaking of losing their child for more than 90 seconds. And to end the conversation, they know they say something that we think is fairly ridiculous, perhaps even crazy. Great example, in one of our studies, a mom was being told yet again that her child was dying, and she said to me, how many times do they think I need to hear it? I know, my child's dying. So I said, yeah, I know, but I'm thinking of taking her to Disney World. In fact, I'm thinking of going in about six to eight weeks. It'll be a wonderful thing to do for the family. We, of course, as a very caring team, not wanting her to be deceived, said, perhaps I wasn't blunt enough. Perhaps I didn't use the right words. Let's go over again how seriously ill your child is. Very hard then for a parent to have a conversation about my child is dying. But we have had those conversations with parents over our 12 studies now. And I want to share with you results from the first four because we were completely perplexed by them. We started out uh, really quite frightened about doing harm, and so we worked first with parents whose child had already died, and then we began working with parents who had just made an end-of-life decision on behalf of their child, and we asked them, what was it that helped you to make this decision? And they taught us nine factors. Now, most of these, I think you would say, yes, yes, I know what that means. Uh, nothing more to do. We've done everything we can. You've done what you can do well. We've done what we can do well. It's all been done. Help on my faith to know that there's something better waiting for my child, and so on. But notice this factor in red, deciding as a good parent would. For the life of us as a team, we really did not know what that meant. And so we went back for more federal funding in order to investigate, what does this mean? 
being a good parent to my very ill child. And we developed a concessional model. I'll only briefly mention this to you that parents indicated that when their child is so desperately ill, they're watching the child's physical body. They want clues to believe that, in fact, their child isn't going to survive. They so appreciate it when you show them scans, x-rays. But they're also listening to your words. They may look very skeptical, perhaps even defiant, but they're listening. They also then have contacted family members and friends and asked them to please get on the internet, contact other settings, find out, have in fact I done everything that I can do? And then again, that factor, doing as a good parent would do. So with the added funding, we did interview more than 60 parents about what is it that makes them a good parent when their child is so desperately ill. <laughs> that work has been extended exquisitely by Dr. Tessie October here. She's done far more and far better than what we did originally, and she will speak with you about couples and how different they are when they are rating what is most important to them at end of life. And she will also be able to talk with you about African-American couples and white couples data that we did not have until Dr. October began her research. We also are partnering with Dr. Chris Fuser and CHOP, and we have interviewed more than 200 families referred to palliative care. And I want to share with you this set of words. I hope these words will be useful to you in your own practice. So we've learned in working with parents that there's something internal that's very important to them about helping their child who is now so very ill. And we always lead into this conversation with parents saying that. And because we've learned that, we want to learn from this parent what is most important to that parent. And so we ask the question, please would you share with me your definition of being a very good parent to your ill child now? And I would share with you that in asking this question to now over 400 parents of very ill children, they never hesitate to give me their definition. They know the definition. When we have asked this question, slightly paraphrased, to parents of well children, they'll say to me, that is a great question. I'd like to think about it. I'll get back to you. So when your child's health is in jeopardy, this definition is right in front of you. You're living it every day. And this is the definition that we were able to induce from all of those interviews and which has now been validated in the work by Dr. October and the work by Dr. Fugner. And it might surprise you. In the definition, parents talk about their definition of being good, staying at the bedside when they sure wish they didn't have to be, being well-informed so that they can contribute to the decision-making that's very likely going to happen, <laughs> or receiving information they wish they didn't have to have, but they want, still trying to teach their children to believe that there's a greater life after this life, still trying to teach them to have respect for others and to care about others, still trying to clothe, feed, house, even in circumstances where you and I might be surprised that they were trying to do that. But most importantly, still trying to convince their child that he or she has been very well loved. Children as well, we've had the privilege of interviewing at end of life and talking with them about what is it that helped them to make an end of life decision. They're very clear that the predominant reason is they were thinking of others. They wanted to do something that would take care of their parents and not being resuscitated. Going on hospice care seemed to them to be a way of helping their parents. But it wasn't just their parents. The second category of people who they cared about and wanted to help were their physicians and their nurses. Children saying, I'm willing to live a little bit longer if it would help my doctor or my nurse. <coughs> so great caring about others while being so seriously ill. You might have doubts about children being competent to be included in end-of-life discussions. That would be honest of you. That would be legitimate. We haven't been able to document about that. But in fact, we've asked children three questions. What will happen right away because of this decision? What will happen later? And what will ultimately happen because you made this end of life decision? And all children in our studies have been able to say, what would happen immediately? I'll have pain. 
I'll probably suffer. What will happen, I'll live a little bit further down. I won't be able to play anymore. And what ultimately happens, I'm going to die. Those are the three critical elements of competence to participate in an end-of-life decision, demonstrated by children as young as eight and all the way to age 18. I'd like very much to call attention to you now about how we have grown this work. If we talk about being a good parent, my very ill child, children are talking to us about being a good patient while being so ill and being a good child to my parents when I'm so ill. And this is work led by Dr. Megan Weaver, just a wonderful colleague of ours, also a member of our special interest group for pediatric payees of an end-of-life care and research. And she very carefully interviewed more than 40 adolescents at two different cancer centers, ours and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And I want to only briefly share with you that these children knew exactly what they were defining. They gave key codes for what they considered to be a good child and a good patient. And from that, we were able to develop conceptual definitions, much like we did for the good parent. All that I'm going to point out to you is that these children talk about wanting to cooperate, wanting to take the medicine, wanting to do what's right, wanting to please. You'll notice that the definition of being a good parent and the definition of being a good child has really interesting conceptual overlap. They're both related all about somebody else doing well by someone else. They both also talk a lot about showing love, reducing burden, and helping. We believe that it's evidence for that end-of-life care, end-of-life decision-making is really about relationships. In all of our studies, including the one just led by Dr. Weaver, we've been able to document an impressive percentage of children who show empathy for others. Every developmental theory that you and I have memorized says children are not able to be empathic. Children who are seriously ill and dying are. I do want you to know that it's great that we have all this research. It's great that we have it funded at the federal level. The National Institute of Nursing Research has stepped forward to fund this kind of research. They are the point institute on campus, and they are funding all disciplines. We're very excited about that. And we do have funding here from NINR. Dr. Lyon has R01s. I have R01s. I also want you to know that Dr. Tessie October is funded federally. Dr. Debbie LaFon is funded by a Sojourners Award. So within Children's National alone, we have great examples of federal and foundation funding. I also want you to know that there are new RFAs, PARs open for funding at NIH. And now NINR is going further, not just funding, but creating resources in English and Spanish for clinicians and for families. And if you talk to Dr. LaFon, she says not one day goes by that she doesn't use the NINR resources with families. But words are powerful, aren't they? And we just had a lot of words. But I'm going to talk with you about a few words, just two death panels, and how death panels, uttered first in 2009 by Sarah Palin, immediately sank the Affordable Care Act language that was related to Paley to an end of life, stripped that bill of any funding for that level of care. Now, since that time, let me just share with you, in retrospect, how death panels is perceived a discredited political term, discredited, originated with Sarah Palin, but very quickly backed up by Rush Limbaugh, Newt Gingrich, Glenn Beck. That bill was the result, stripping of the language, was the result of the power of these words. Since that time, it's been called the lie of the year, the whopper, most outrageous new term, but in a matter of weeks, death panels had this kind of effect. Where was our voice? Then, in July of this year, CMS stepped forward and said, we actually are going to pay for conversations at end of life. And the very next day, Mrs. Palin stepped forward again and said, this will lead to rationed care, decided upon by a panel of faceless bureaucrats who rational people like me, 
will argue will measure a person's worth using disagreeable criteria as they justify doling out limited government controlled care. That, my friend, is a death penalty. So it may be a discredited term. The person speaking it may be discredited, but the voice continues. And it appears that 30% of all Americans who heard about this think it's true. So words are very powerful then. They make for good headlines, but they don't make for good care, which means that you and I have to be ready with our own words. So although those words were very powerful, I do want you to know that CMS is now funding end-of-life conversations at more than 140 hospices in 40 states, and will be running this experiment for the next five years. So now let me ask you, what words would you choose? What words would you have ready for stakeholders? What words for a Sarah Palin? who says death panel, you must have your words ready. You must be ready for the unexpected, and you must expect the unexpected with end of life. You'll notice that with the title of the 2015 Institute of Medicine report, we use the word honoring. You also might have noticed that the funder was anonymous for this report, but it came very quickly on the heels a Sarah Palin's death panel announcement. Some took notice, but we struggled as a panel of experts to come up with words. <coughs> but because she said, it's a panel of bureaucrats who will not give care to my child with Down syndrome, who will not give care to my elderly mother, we emphasized honoring the individual, honoring preferences. Please think about your words, be ready, this is what you and I can do in pediatric end of life. We want to be ready with our own powerful words. We want to help parents to achieve their definition of being a good parent to a very ill child, and if possible, to help an ill child to achieve his or her definition of being a good patient and a good child. And most importantly, you and I want to offer to talk. Thank you so very, very much. And we do have a couple of minutes if anyone has a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Pam, exceptional as always. It's uh, just extraordinary to hear you speak. Thank you very much for your, you. your presentation. Uh, Pam, I'm interested in timeline. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an emergency medicine doc, and frequently uh, our end-of-life discussions get compressed yes. to minutes as opposed to months and mm -hmm. years. Uh, intensive care unit doctors, those occur on the uh, order of days, and oftentimes mm -hmm. in the chronic care setting and of cancer, they evolve over months or even years. Um, are the principles the same in all those contexts? How does this work operationally uh, from your perspective, and, and what are the priorities under those various uh, scenarios? Thank you so much, Stephen, for the question. I'm going to say something that might be uh, surprising to you. We have often <clears throat> excuse me, thought that the person who leads the end-of-life discussion has got to be the person who knows the family the best. And in the conditions that Dr. Teach is just describing, nobody knows the family well at all. And so then we look for the, the person on the team who is feeling clear, confident, connected to this family and able to look at them and say honestly about what's happening. And what families have said to us is words are important, but they're not enough. You've got to draw it. Can you not draw it out for me? So now you're saying something to a family, and then you're drawing it. Sometimes a scan works equally well, but they want something more than just a voice and just words. And third, families talk about touch. Um, when I have done follow-ups, sometimes two years after a child has died, um, parents can tell me exactly what the physician was wearing, exactly what the hair looked like, exactly what the facial expressions were, and exactly the attire. That has stayed with them. And they can tell me exactly how the physician touched them, where, how, the pressure. And they remember some words, not all. But they sure remember what you look like, and they sure remember how you touched them. So it's not necessarily meant to be the burden of one single person on a team. And I think many times in healthcare, 
we do burden physicians by having to be a the person. What I'm going to say is what helps a family so much is when we coordinate the conversation and they feel like we are together in the conversation. It's not unusual for a family to interview others who come in the room to ask them, what do you mean by resuscitation? You and I have at least nine definitions of, de of resuscitation, and we might each give one of the nine. And the parent is then going to wonder, do we know what resuscitation is? So the team approach is critically important. And every study comes back and talks about the negative that can happen when any single team member doesn't know what the conversation has been. One of the examples we've been able to document in two studies now is when a team member doesn't know what the conversation has been, can't find it documented in the health record, and feels as if he or she has to go in the room and ask the parent directly, what was the conversation and were you able to decide in the way that you wanted? And the parent has responded, do you know something I don't know? Did I make a mistake? Well, very important for us as teams to speak directly to each other. No exclusion. And it's hard to document all the time. Um, so we've got to have a way then of speaking clearly with each other about key words that were used, with who, and the reaction. We need more data from the ED. Dr. October is taking the lead beautifully in the intensive care unit, but we need more ED. We should collaborate. Thank you for the question. Pam, I just want to take a minute to say thank you. That was exceptional, exceptional as always, and we're so fortunate to have you here leading this work and this research along with so many others as well. And I think what it, what as we, our pagers are going off and it's high census and the Joint Commission mock survey is starting now, it just, this was the best hour for me this entire week oh, Kathy, this to, to take a pause and to remind us how far we have come with the palliative care program, but how much farther we have to go. And, um, and our commitment from our clinical teams that we need, from our, our administrative, our resources, et cetera. So thank you so thank much. You, and we all learned something today in terms of what we can take back to our own clinical practice or as we're rounding with patients and families. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you all.